Great. All right, so today's lecture, lecture number 10, we're going to be talking about game actions and replay systems. So game input and actions. Now this may seem, this is something that when you talk to a person who plays a lot of video games, it seems really intuitive and really obvious, but for a programmer or implementation of video games, you know, it, it makes sense to talk about this sort of thing and talk about it from a software engineering or, arc or game engine architecture point of view. Because it does, it may seem at first that what we're about to do for this course, at least, might be a little bit of overkill, we'll say, but it really does end up helping our game engine architecture. And especially if you go on to make, you know, more impressive games, this sort of thing will help you a lot. So games, of course, are interactive. It's what separates games from movies or TV shows, is that you actually interact with them. And the players of games influence the gameplay via input devices. So whatever game you're playing, in my opinion, the thing that makes it a game is that you interact with it through some input device. So um, I was at a GDC conference once, which had some, it had an entire... Um, section like of the floor space devoted to games with interesting input. And so for, for example, games that don't use computer or mouse. Uh, one of them, you have it was kind of like Flappy Bird, but you had to blow into a tube harder or softer in order to get the bird to fly higher or lower. Uh, another one, you had to like shout at things. And so, you know, we're, we're used to keyboard, mouse, joystick, controller, that sort of thing. Um, but there could be a number of different types of into, in, input devices that players can use. So inputs are the things that are given by the player of a game to influence what the entities do. So an input would be the pressing of a key, uh, a mouse click, moving the mouse, uh, a joystick, a controller, something like that. That is an input, the actual clicking of the input device. The result, so the desired result of a player when they perform an input is that they want an action to happen in the game, right? So for example, the reason I'm pressing the A button on an NES controller isn't because I love pressing this A button, it's to accomplish the task of getting Mario to jump, right? Or the reason I'm pressing to the right is because if I press right, Mario walks to the right or Mega Man or whoever. Um, if I move my mouse in Counter-Strike, I'm aiming. And if I click the button, I'm shooting, right? It's almost like the input is a necessary evil. Like if you could just think, you know, jump, then the input would be the thinking. But you know, Neuralink or whatever hasn't been uh, invented yet to that point. But you know, you can think of input devices over time evolving and eventually maybe we have just some sort of direct link to the game. But the whole point of this slide is just trying to say that there is a difference between your input and the action in the game, right? One is gameplay mechanics, the other is the reading of a system interrupt to get an input from a user. They, they are separate things. Um, so, these actions are also in some software engineering disciplines called commands, right? We want to command the game somehow. So I could have called them commands, but I'm calling them actions because I think that that makes a little bit more sense in the context of our game engine. So these commands, that, that's essentially what we're trying to do. We are trying to command the entity in the game that we control to do something, okay? So, it really doesn't matter to the player which input causes an action as long as it's like easy to perform, right? So it doesn't matter whether it's the A button or the B button that makes Mario jump, as long as you are physically capable of pressing those buttons in sort of an intuitive and um, an ergonomic way, right? Now, in order to get, I'm sure you've played like a first person shooter game on a console, like a PS4 or something like that, where you have two joysticks and like the left joystick probably makes the player move. The right joystick is for aiming. Then you've got like a shoulder button where you're like, you bring a weapon up and then you, so you have to press like seven different inputs just to get something to fire, 
right? So I'm not very good at, at shooter games on consoles because that many inputs feels really unintuitive to me as a PC gamer who just moves my mouse and then clicks on someone to, to shoot them, right? So what the input is, it doesn't really matter as long as you can perform it, right? So the input device is for the gameplay part of things. It's not really that important as long as it's possible. So, um, similarly, the game engine shouldn't care which input device causes the action to be triggered, right? So, there's a big difference between the actual reading of the inputs and parsing those somehow, like knowing that the W key was pressed or knowing that the middle mouse button was pressed, and then the actual action itself, like jump, that wants to be triggered in the game engine. So, the game engine in the gameplay uh, system should only care about the action logic itself and how to carry it out. It, so what we really want to do is we want to completely decouple the action logic from the input logic, right? So there, yes, there has to be something in our game engine that says, is the W key pressed, right? But the thing that actually performs the actions in the game should not have to care about the W key, right? Because that we could, could remap our keys. So maybe the jump, instead of, uh, instead of it being W, maybe it's the space bar, maybe it's the tab key, maybe it's the enter key or the J key. It doesn't really matter as long as um, that has been specified by the user somehow. So, so far in our game engine, we've been performing actions directly inside the SFML event loop, right? So when a specific key is pressed, some specific game logic gets called. That's what we've been doing so far. And so in our current game, we have no way of separating the two or being able to like specify or remap which keys do what, etc., etc. So let's change that. The whole point of this lecture is to explain how we are going to uh, decouple inputs from actions, how we're going to be able to remap keys, and what this is going to give us in terms of functionality later down the road. So in our assignment 2 architecture, we didn't really have anything that looks like an action, right? We have our game class over here. Um, it handled user input directly. And then we have Entity Manager, Entity Vec2, and Components. It's, it's a pretty simple architecture. Somewhere within that code is this line of code right here, right? Where you say, okay, inside my event loop, if the game event is that my key is pressed, then which key was it and do something based on that. So for example, if the W key was pressed specifically, my up input component is going to be set to true. Uh, if A was pressed, then my left input component was going to be set to true. Um, if P was pressed, then I'm directly calling this function that sets the game to paused and stuff like that. So you can see here that the reading of inputs and some of the game logic is not decoupled whatsoever. There's no way in my code for me to rebind, for example, and binding meanings like remap the keys saying, so for example, if I wanted the space bar to now be the up or the jump button, I could no longer do that, right? I, I couldn't do that in this architecture. There's no code there that lets me do that. So how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna separate these two? So in assignment two, all of our input handling and systems logic were done in the game class because we only had one scene type, right? Moving forward, we're going to have a game engine class that can many en manage any number of scene objects. So let's have a look at that again. Let's recall what this game engine um, class is doing. So over here um, in the top right, we can see we have our game engine class. We have a internal variable called scenes, and that's going to map strings to scenes. It has the window, has the assets, etc. So that's what we talked about last time. So I won't go into too much detail about this, but just remember that the game engine class stores the top level game data. So it stores the assets, it stores the window, it stores the scenes. It handles the top level functionality. So like how users interact, like the actual inputs of the game. 
So this game engine class is going to be handling the input, but it's not going to be handling the logic. Okay, so it's going to be saying, oh, did you press the W key? That's cool. Did you press the enter key? That's cool. And then it's going to trigger the specific action that the game wants, the, the game scene wants to be triggered based on that input. It's also going to handle the changing of scenes. It's going to have the game main loop and then etc. So we talked about this uh, a bit last time. Now, Remember, we have a scene class as well. So we're going to have a, uh, a scene base class and then a number of derived scene classes that implement base uh, specific functionality. This scene base class is going to be where our actions are actually stored. So what our actions do. Um, so the scene base class is going to store that. And then the scene specific functionality is carried out in the derived classes. And remember that the base scene is abstract. It can't be instantiated, etc. And then the scene derived class stores the scene specific data. So it's going to store like a level, maybe a player pointer, or a configuration. And then the systems are defined within this derived class. So the systems, the, the specific logic that needs to be carried out when a specific action is performed is specific, I know I said specific a lot, to the scene, right? The derived scene class. Because the action of jump might be different in one scene than in another scene. Okay. So how are we going to implement these actions? So we're going to try and implement a system where the scene only knows the type of action that the player wants to perform and doesn't care about the input method. So again, this is very important. That's why I'm repeating it is that our scenes, the derived scene classes. So for example, we might have a menu scene. We might have a, a gameplay scene. Those scenes, they're only going to know the player wants to move up. The player wants to shoot. It doesn't have any knowledge of what keys were used to do that. So in this way, what we're doing is, is we're saying that actions could actually come from anywhere. So we could have actions come from a keyboard. We could have them come from a mouse, a replay file, a network stream, a VR controller, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, you know, if we just wrote a little network layer on the bottom of this, we could have a multiplayer game. Because the scene doesn't care that the action came from um, uh, like a W key on a local keyboard or it came from a network packet. We also get replays for free because you could just be reading in actions from a file, right? It doesn't matter how the actions are input to the system. The game engine only cares, oh, it wanted to jump at this specific time. So we're going to create an action class. And that action class is going to store the type of the action that the player wants the scene to perform. All of the input is going to be handled within the game engine class, right? So that's the actual reading of key presses. That's going to be done with the game engine class. And then it's going to, the game engine class is going to construct the actions. So it's going to create the actions and then send those actions to the scenes to have their logic actually carried out in code. So the scene itself is going to have a do action function that performs the logic based on a specific, a specific action object. All right. So the action class, what's that actually going to look like? It's going to have, so an action class is going to be very, very basic. It's going to have each action is going to have a name. So for example, this action could be jump. It could be move right, it could be shoot, it could be pause, whatever. So it's going to have a name. And so actions input via the keyboard or controller will have two phases, right? Like you think that an action is just the pressing of a button. Well, it is, but the pressing of a button actually has two steps, okay? It has the pressing, like the actual pushing down of a button. And then sometime later comes the actual releasing of a button. So what we are doing in this game is we are saying in this, in this engine architecture is saying that each action is going to have, um, as well as its name, 
it's going to have a type. So the type is just going to be start or end. So start or end means press or release, right? So what is that going to look like? Well, here is what our action class is going to look like. And it's very, very simple. We just have a string for the name of the action and a string for the type of the action. So this might be jump, left, up, down, shoot, and type is going to be start or end. Really, really simple. Now, for all of you out there who have worked on, you know, AAA games or your own game engine, the, the immediate and proper response to this is, oh my God, why are they using um, strings, right? Because obviously this is a, this is a situation where an integer would be better, right? However, as I keep having to say during this course, um, a lot of times where we could specify like a list of integers, right? So instead of strings, what we could do for each game is we could have a list of integer enums or something that says like int jump equals zero, int left equals one, int up equals two. And we could specify integers here so that we wouldn't have to like have the overhead of strings. I, I completely understand that. However, the caveat here is that what you lose when you do that is that if you want to add like a new, um, there's a couple of things that you lose and it's always a balance, right? So you gain speed and efficiency, 100%. It'll be a bit faster if you use integers instead of strings here. However, the thing that you lose is that um, whenever you create a new type of action that you want to perform, well, then you have to go maintain that list of integers. And that's a little bit annoying. Um, also, it makes it a little bit less readable to the user. So for example, um, if you had uh, a replay file and you were trying to create a replay file from scratch, you would have to like memorize that list of integers. So, okay, jump was zero, um, like go right was three or something like that. So when you're writing down the actions, you wouldn't, you know, you'd have to remember all that. And that's a little bit annoying. So this is a little bit more human readable, we'll say. And again, uh, this course is a, is a balance between like ease of use, usability, learnability, and efficiency. And it turns out that it is not at all the bottleneck in our game. So, so the bottleneck is not the issuing of actions, right? Because the game is playing at 60 frames per second. And maybe, maybe like 1% of those frames will actually have an action being inputted. So the creation of an action, the comparison of strings, yes, it's, it's slower if you use strings. I understand that. But for our game engine for this course, it's going to make some things just very convenient. And if you were writing a AAA game, you would absolutely use integers here. But we're going to go with strings for now because they're a little bit easier to use. Okay? So I, I always have to put that in there that I understand that this is not the most efficient way to do this. So please don't write two pages of comments stating that because I'm well aware of, of that. And so are the students, but this just makes it a little bit easier to use. So action start and end. What does that exactly mean? Well, as I said before, the action start is the pressing of the button and the action end is the releasing of a button. So for example, let's say we have an action, which is right start. So if we issue the action right start, the player or the entity, let's say we're playing Mario, for example, the player will run to the right as if you have, as if you are holding down the right button continuously. So if all you do is tell the game engine to start holding right, you, you only stop moving to the right when you say stop holding right. Okay. So for every action, if you want it to end, you have to specifically specify, I want that to end. So if I issued the action right start on the first frame of the game, and then 60 frames later, I said right end, then for those 60 frames, so like one second, if it's 60 frames a second, Mario would be running to the right. And that's the way that we are doing this. Now, this is not the only way that you can do actions like this, okay? Um, if you've ever done any tool assisted speed running or tassing, um, if you've done like NES tassing, I've done a little bit of it, 
then what you actually do for those is you would essentially have a list of actions uh, or a list of inputs on every single frame of the game, right? So you would see for every single frame, what are the inputs that I'm holding for those frames? So um, you would say, for example, if you wanted to run to the right for one second, then you would have to specify for 60 different frames, I want to be holding the right button. Okay, now that's fine if you're tassing, because maybe if you're doing actually like really hardcore computer controlled speed runs where you want it to do all these glitches and stuff, then almost every frame of the game you'll be switching inputs and all this cool stuff. But that is not very human readable, right? So this is a trade off in that specification where instead of doing um, for example, on frame 10, start holding right, and on frame 50, stop holding right, you would actually specify all 50 of those frames, or all 40 of those frames that I want to hold right. So that way is much more tedious to input, and in the end, they both accomplish the exact same task, okay? Think about it this way. If you were to write a replay file, and in that replay file, you could choose one of the following. Either the replay file specifies all of the inputs for each frame of the game. So like maybe if your game lasted 10 minutes, that's 10 times 60 times 60. Okay, what's that? 36,000? So you would have 36,000 lines of inputs for that, for that replay. Versus maybe if the player was only inputting, you know, one action every 10 seconds, specified in this way, then it would be far, like a, like a way smaller replay file, it would be far more human readable, etc. So you can do it both ways. You could either specify the inputs on every single frame, or you could have an action system like this, which specifies when the actions start, meaning when you start holding down the button, and when the action ends means when you release the button. And I personally believe there's no, there's no provable answer that one is better than the other because they both have use cases. But I believe that for this course, this is the better way to do it. So that's why we're doing it. Okay, so now we've talked about what an action looks like. Now we have to talk about how do we actually map keys to actions? Well, some of you, if you've been paying attention to this course, we like using some maps, right? Maps are pretty good. So we want to be able to specify which user input, so for example, which keyboard key maps to a specific action object, okay? Well, how are we going to do that in practice? Well, in SFML, all of our keyboard keys have associated integer values. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty convenient. So let's use a standard map from inputs, which are integer values, to strings, which are our actions. Okay, so... This integer here, which is the key, is the SFML key code for the keyboard key. And the string is just the name of the action to be performed. So we can just store a map from ints to strings. Now again, some of you might rightfully be questioning this choice of a map from ints to strings, because typically, if you can map from ints to something, then you should use a vector, right? Because vector indices are integers. However, um, there are so many different input input keyboard key integers. There's like two or 300 of them, for example. And so we might have this vector of length two or 300 that only has one or two actual integers mapped to it, maybe five, maybe 10 at the most. So I think that we'll just use a map and it's a little bit less efficient uh, in terms of like the lookup time, but standard map is okay for this because again, the amount of times that this is actually going to be called is once per user input. So it's not an extreme bottleneck of, of performance in our game engine. So the scene base class is going to store this map because every derived scene is going to want to be able to map its actions. So rather than, you know, duplicate that code in every derived scene, we're going to have that in, in the base scene. So the base scene is going to have a standard map from ints to strings, and the strings are the name of the actions, and that's going to be called our action map. So the, the variable name, it's a private variable, so we have m underscore action map. 
So in order to, I'm going to say register or to map a key to an action. So to register a key to an action, we're going to create a function. And that function is called register action, which will just insert the action name into the map. So if I want to register action, so I could say register action W key, and I want that to be moving up, for example, well, then this is what I do. I simply just put that into the map and I'm done. So each scene is going to have its own map. So we can have different actions for different keys on different scenes. So this is, this is pretty neat. So let's just look at what this might look like. So for assignment three, we are going to have a menu scene. Okay. So this menu scene in its initialization, we're going to do this registering of actions. So it's really simple. We're just going to say, Hey, register the W key to moving up, register the S key to moving down, register the D key to play, register the escape key to quit. Right? So we can see here how like just being able to specify these strings is just kind of nice, right? Here, we don't have to like have a, an integer mat, like a, an integer enum somewhere that we look up. It's just kind of nice to be able to just use strings, right? So we've registered this action. And that means that now when our game engine reads the W key, the game engine can ask the menu scene, hey, do you have anything bound or, or registered to the W key? If you do, do that thing. If you don't, then don't do anything. Okay. So the question now is how do we create the action objects? Well, uh, let, I, I want to make this appear rather than just have all at once. Okay. So the game engine class is going to be handling the actual user input, right? So the game engine, this is this low level class that, uh, where's my laser pointer? Here it is. So the game engine class is going to handle the actual user input and the key presses. And then the game engine is going to construct the action and then send it to the current scene. So how does the game, like we said, we've decoupled all of this, right? So how does the game engine know which action to be constructed based on what was just pushed, right? So how does the game engine know, okay, the up action should be done if I press the W key. Well, when a key is pressed, since we have this map right here, right? The scene, so the game engine knows which scene is currently active. And the scene knows which keys are mapped to which actions. So when a game when the when the key is pressed, the game engine can just ask the scene, "Hey, do you have an action associated with this integer value, which is, an, which is a, a keyboard press. If the scene has the associated action, we can create the action type with the correct name and type, or we can create the action object, sorry, with the correct name and type. So we can say, oh, look, um, if the key was pressed, right? If the key was pressed, then we are starting an action. If the key was released, then we're ending an action. So this is what this code looks like. And this is the actual solution code for assignment three, because I'm giving you this for assignment three. Um, for A3, I've made a number of changes to the architecture that I have done for you. And the reason for that is because the gameplay programming in assignment three is going to be kind of, kind of intense. There's a lot of functionality that you have to do for, for assignment three. So I have given you a bunch of the game engine stuff already implemented, but even though you don't have to implement it, I do want you to understand it. So that's why I'm, I'm explaining it here. So here is the code inside the game engine class that detects a key press, asks the scene if it knows what this key should do. If it does, then it says construct an action of that type and then tell the scene to do this current action. So. This is inside the main event loop right here. We have already detected that there's a keyboard event. It's outside of this loop. And then it says, if the key, if the event type is key pressed or the event type is key released, 
Okay, so now we're inside the main loop of the, sorry, the event handling loop, and we've detected that a key has either been pressed or released. So in the game engine, we're going to be able to get access to the current scene. So we have current scene. I have just this function. It's going whatever scene is current is the one that's going to be wanting to parse these inputs. So we say, hey, current scene, get the action map. And in that action map, try and find this key code. So it essentially says, do you have any key in your action map associated with this key code? And if that is equal to the end of the map, continue. So this essentially says, if you don't have anything associated with this key, then skip this key press. Don't do any action, right? So there's two ways of writing if statements when, when it comes to programming. Um, one way is this sort of thing where if this is true, do the stuff inside of here. The other way of doing it is saying, if this thing I don't want to happen is true, then skip it. Okay, so I could have said if we do have something associated, then I could have another indent, but I like to indent as little as possible. So here, this basically said if the scene doesn't know what to do with this key, then we skip it. It's not an actual action. So for example, if our game only knows about W, A, S, and D, and we press the H key, then here it'll say, oh, the scene doesn't know what to do with the H key, so just skip it. Go to the next event. That's it. But if this, is, if this is false, if it does know what to do with this key, then we're going to construct an action. So first we get the action type, right? The type is whether or not we are starting or ending the action. So if the event type was a key pressed, pressing down, then this is the start of that action. So we'll record start. Otherwise, if it's not key pressed, then it's key released, and so it should be end. Right? So this is what this, this if statement does. So it sets up the action type. And then what we do is we construct the action. So we construct the action in place right here. And what we do is we say, hey, scene, get your action map and give me the string that's located at the key code. And the string that's located at the key code is the name of the action. So for example, if we had W meaning up, then inside this action map, at the location of the key code of the W key, we would have up as a string. And so this action constructor takes in a name and it takes in a type. And so we construct the action up start. And then we say, hey, current scene, do that action. So this is all the game engine knows. The game engine doesn't know anything about what the actions mean, right? It just says, hey, whichever scene is currently playing, do you know what to do with this key? If you do know what to do with this key, here you go. Do that action. There you go. So now that we've constructed the action, we send it to the scene to have its logic performed. This is done by the derived scene classes do action function. So there's a, there's a system, there's an action system. So S is for system, do action. That's the scenes system for doing actions. We read the name and the type of the action and perform its logic without knowing the user input that created it. So here's the code of the menu scene. So have I done that for you? Is this solution code? Okay, whether or not I'm giving you solution code right here, I don't care, I just wanna show you an example. So inside the menu scene of our game, we have this do action function. It takes in a reference to an action. And we're basically saying, okay, if the action type of that action is start, if the action name was up, then move up in my menu. So this code here just selects the next thing in the menu or the previous thing in the menu. If it was down, then move down in the menu, right? Change the menu selected index. If it was play, then, hey, game engine, change the scene, right? And if it was quit, then just call the on end function of this. So this is what your do action function looks like. It reads in the type of action and then does the logic based on that action. Now, 
if you have, uh, again, I, I really like explaining to people the different ways in which you could accomplish this. This is not the only way that you could accomplish this. And some people are actually quite against this way of doing things. So there's two ways that you could really do actions in scenes. One is this way, where the scene reads the type of action and then based on what type of action it is, it does something. Okay, this is one way of accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. The other way of doing it that is done in some places is that the action itself does the logic. Okay, so in that sense, in some systems, they would have action, have a lot of logic in the action. So for example, um, you could have a base class of action and then a derived class of action, which is like shoot action. And then that shoot action derived class would be passed a reference to the scene. And then the action would be able to modify the scene. Okay. And in that way, you would have all of your action code encapsulated within the action class rather than the scene class. And that is a perfectly valid way of doing things. However, it conflicts a little bit with our architecture. Okay, so that's why I'm not doing it here. And also in this way, the actions are just pure data, right? So when the actions are just pure data and we let the systems do their thing, that is more fitting with the architecture that we are trying to achieve in this course. But just realize that you, it is completely valid in some architectures to have this logic for what an action is supposed to do, right? So for example, the action class might be the thing that makes the entity jump, okay? Just, just keep in mind that there are two ways of doing it. We have chosen this one for this course. And I also think that this one is the most intuitive and the easiest to implement. So again, there's a bunch of different ways to do things. I've chosen this for a specific reason. So this is what your do action is going to look like. In the actual um, gameplay scene where, you know, Mega Man is jumping around and stuff, you'll have things like if action type is start, okay. If the action name is jump, then I'll do something when I jump. If the action name is shoot, then I'll do something when I shoot, right? And so that's what's that, that's what it's going to look like for a more complex uh, scene. Replays. Let's talk about replays for a second. Many games have functionality to be able to record gameplay in the form of replays. So this is actually, it's still true for a lot of games. Some games have replay files. However, as video recording technology has become more and more prevalent and more, um, uh, what am I trying to say? More efficient as video file sizes come down. Most games have the ability to record like videos of your gameplay instead of actual replay files. But the reason that replay files, in my opinion, are still better is because replay files just record the actions. Right? So a replay file, if you look at a replay file for something like a StarCraft, right? You're clicking, you're, you're, there's so much stuff going on in the game. The game might be an hour long, right? If you're playing a complex game like StarCraft. And so what the replay file is, is just the sequence of actions that happened. Now, there are benefits and drawbacks to replay files. The ben one of the main benefits to a replay file is that you can play it back in the game engine. Maybe you can rewind it. Maybe you can fast forward it, right? You can skip around. The replay file is good in that way. The second benefit of a replay file is that it's very, very um, small. In comparison to a video file, a replay file might be one thousandth or even one millionth of the size, right? If you think about an hour long video file, if it's high quality, it might be gigabytes. But the same replay file, which just records the actions, might only be like a kilobyte or a megabyte or something like that. So 
Uh, someone's talking about replay files and ghosts. Yep, I'll show you in a second. Actually, I have I have ex literally examples of that. So now that our scenes, oh, and the drawbacks, sorry, the drawback to a replay file is that you can't put a replay file on YouTube. You can only put a video on YouTube, right? So the replay file must be played back in the game engine itself. So you can't, if you want to show your friend what you did in a game, sure, you can send them a replay file, but if they don't have the game, they can't watch the replay file. So the drawback of a replay file is that you have to watch it in the game engine. Okay. But that could also be a benefit is that you can watch it in the game engine, right? So as someone just said that you can enable a ghost in a replay, I'll show an example of that in a second. So now that our scenes don't care about where actions came from, right? We just have a do action function. We can see how easy it would be to implement replay files. For example, we could just store our action strings in a file along with the game frame that they were performed on. Then if I have like a replay mode or something in my game engine, when I load the replay file, the game engine, if it says, hey, I'm in replay mode, then it would just read in that file and send the actions at the appropriate time. So for example, I could just say in this replay file, like at frame 100, um, shoot. And that is a shoot start, right? And at 110, um, shoot end. And at uh, 200, jump start. Right? So that would be my replay file. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't draw very well with the mouse. I normally don't write that bad. But you can see how a replay file would be almost like just a few minutes of work. And you might say, okay, well, I don't want to just, you know, watch replays. What is What good is a replay file? Well, as someone in the chat already said, you can have ghosts as replay or replays implement something called ghosts. So for example, if you've ever played a racing game all the way back to the, to the Super NES and even before that, they implemented ghost files. And so what a ghost, or not a ghost file, but a ghost in a, in, a, in a racing game is essentially if you've recorded a high score, right? Then the ghost of that could be played back while you are driving. And it's called a ghost because they, you, they normally just like make it a little bit transparent so it doesn't interfere with your gameplay. But... <clears throat> You can also think about how easy it might be to implement a ghost now because all you're doing is recording the actions. And so if you've got the actions of your high score recorded, then all you do is do those actions for this other entity that's now a little bit transparent while you're doing the actions for the player at the same time. So the ECS system really makes replays trivial to do. So. Here's another example in Celeste um, of, of ghosts, right? So you can see, actually, so I've never played Celeste. Um, I apologize if this is not true. I Googled game, game replay ghosts and this came up. So you can see how you might do something like this in a, um, in a platformer as well. And I'm going to give a demo after this of, of something really cool. So, so stick around for that. So our game engine architecture, as we talked about already, is, is increasing in size and scope. However, it's not gonna get much more complicated than this, okay? So it might look a little bit intimidating, but just realize that this is all very modular and compartmentalized. So the game engine does something very specific. The base class of scene does something very specific. We're gonna have a play scene, a menu scene, we have our entity manager, that's already done for us. We have our entities, assets, animations. You can see how like nicely compartmentalized that is. You can see what each file does, et cetera, et cetera. So our, we'll talk more about the architecture when we introduce assignment three, um, and that'll be in a week's time, I believe. But I do wanna show you something that's really neat. And that is, uh, hang on a second here. So I am going to do, 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 I just have to uh, bring it up here. All right, so if I go back to here, put that full screen. All right, 
So this is what I'm showing right now is a, let me actually maximize this in the background. So we have a nice, there we go. So this is essentially the game engine for assignment three. However, I created this game engine years ago and for my own research into artificial intelligence, um, which is what I do for my research um, as a professor, I have modified this game engine to do some really, really cool stuff. So the first thing it, it can do is that you can switch between different game scenes. So for example, here, I'm walking around in this like top-down, almost Diablo-like physics simulator um, where I can like shoot things and they bounce. We're not gonna be doing this in this course, but here is assignment three. Um, this is what you are going to be doing for assignment three. This is what you're going to be doing for assignment four. And the really cool thing is that my game, this game engine architecture that we have is so robust that you can actually have all of these games playing in the same game engine, right? And I can switch between the games in this, ver in this very specific version of it that I've created. So um, why am I showing you this? Well, first of all, it's kind of a preview of Assignment 3. Assignment 3 is pretty neat, actually. We make a fully functional, like, Mega Man, um, Mario hybrid game. Um, you can come over here, you can break blocks, you can, like, there's coins, all sorts of stuff, okay? But the cool thing that I wanted to show you is how you, what you can do with these replay files. So something that I wanted to do in my game, and if you have done Computer Science 3200 with me, or if you're currently doing it, you've heard of the A star pathfinding algorithm. So what I can do is that in this game engine, I can click somewhere, and what I'm about to do is I'm gonna click up here and this actually runs a modified version of the A star algorithm, but for real time video games. And it will find the shortest path from my current location to get up here. So just watch, I'll click. Now I'm not pressing anything. My hands are up here and the AI system in the background found out how to go there. So let's do that once more. It takes like a second to run sometimes. So I click it. Now I'm not pushing anything. And now the AI system is, is actually moving the character. Similarly, if I want to get down here, I can click here and the game knows how to do that. And in fact, it also knows how to like kill stuff. So if I click over here, maybe this one is going to take too long because the search is kind of complex. Let's see. It's kind of running in the background. I can see that may, this one may have been a little bit ambitious. There we go. Okay. No, it's playing now. So the game, the, the game, like the AI knew how to jump and move around. So that's part of my actual research and some, one of my grad students are working on, but this is done with replays. Also, what I can do is if I click up here, instead of moving the actual character, I can spawn a ghost and that ghost will do that stuff. And then I can sort of spawn multiple of these ghosts doing this stuff around the level. Okay, so this is, this is pretty neat. This is all done with the action system that we described today. Like, look at how powerful this is. It's really cool. In fact, what I could do if I wanted to is spawn hundreds or even thousands of Mega Mans. And these are all being done with the exact same architecture that we just talked about. So if you want to do like game testing, right? One of my fields of research is actually in-game testing. You can do it with a system like this. This probably has uh, made the bit rate drop pretty low, but look at this. This is like a thousand, a thousand of these things running. And I know that the frame rate has gone down just a little bit. Actually, I think it's, it's 9,000 of them. I can't remember exactly how many there are, but there's a lot of them, right? And so this game engine architecture is pretty cool. And not only that, but the same AI system can work in any game. So I can, I can control Link around this Zelda clone as well, or spawn a bunch of Zeldas, right? Like it's, it's this really neat modular architecture that is sort of game agnostic. You can create a bunch of different games. Uh, here's, here's Geometry Wars, 
right? Here's our assignment two. We can do the same thing. I can spawn ghosts here. Like, it's really cool what we can do with replay files. Here's another one that's sort of a, like a, a, a maze generator type thing. So we're moving around in a grid and I can spawn a bunch of different replay files. Like, it's really, really cool what we can do with this action and replay architecture. So I just wanted to show that off as a little bit of a teaser and how this is going to afford us um, a bunch of 